I'd like to welcome everybody to our March fourth group meeting. Um, we got a pretty special guest today, Dr. Wong. Dr. Wong is with a uh, suburban and John Hopkins Hospital. Okay, this event will be video recorded and photographed. Video and images may be used in electronic media, including but not limited to Mended Hearts websites, email, and external social media sites. By attending our webinar, you authorize Mended Hearts to use any media from today's event that may include your likeness. If you do not wish to be recorded, our moderator will assess, assist you in making your image and name during the Zoom. Also, please note that Mended Hearts does not provide medical advice. Please contact your physician or other medical provider for any questions about or any other individual health care. With that being said, I'm going to turn it over to Karen to introduce our guest. Karen. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm so glad some of you are, are chiming in. It's good to see some uh, uh, old friends, not old friends, but old friends. So nice to see you all. So tonight we have a very special speaker, Dr. Wong. Um, she is a cardiac surgeon at Suburban Hospital and an assistant professor of surgery at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Uh, she received her bachelor's degree from Dartmouth and a PhD in computational biology and bioinformatics from Duke. Uh, she also holds a certificate in college teaching from Duke, and she has completed her general surgery residency at Duke and cardiothoracic surgery fellowship at Hopkins. Um, she is particularly interested in um, the, the future of artificial intelligence in terms of uh, surgery and hopefully specific, we'll learn um, more specifically about the advances in terms of cardiac care and cardiac health. Um, she is um, also very interested in areas of research. Um, she is curious and, and uh, is filled with information and will educate us tonight about the potential of AI to help innovate and, and enhance various aspects of healthcare. Um, and she has a particular interest in all aspects of cardiac surgery, special interest in mitral valve repair and aortic surgery, including aortic dissections. Um, she also leads a translational research lab that intersects cardiac surgery, computational biology and bioengineering. And so Dr. Wong, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And for those of you that have just logged in, I think, you know, I, I'll, I'll sort of be the judge of the questions. You can either raise your hand and I'll uh, connect you in, or you could certainly type in your question into the chat and I will monitor that as well. So I'll pass it off to Dr. Wong, educate us. I know some of us are already, you know, speculating and talking a little bit about what does, you know, what, what the heck is artificial intelligence? So today I want to talk to you, this, first of all, thank you everyone for coming. Today I want to talk to you about artificial intelligence in medicine, including my journey and the future of artificial intelligence in medicine. Thank you, uh, Karen, for that kind introduction. I actually went to, um, so I, I grew up in China and um, I um, um spend the first 18 years of my life in my hometown in Yangzhou. And then I went to a high school in Nanjing, uh, which is a town across the river. And I actually went to uh, Grinnell College in Iowa for my um, bachelor's degree. And I majored in biology and took a lot of classes in both math and computer science. And then I moved on to uh, uh, Dartmouth for a medical school and subsequently went to Duke for my residency in general surgery, and then my PhD at, as well. I ended up at Johns Hopkins for my cardiothoracic surgery fellowship and finished fellowship last year, joined the faculty at Johns Hopkins last year. I also spent a little bit of time in Germany when I was uh, at Grinnell College. I had a um, exchange study abroad program where I was at uh, Humboldt University as well. So that's 
that's my journey in a nutshell. But more interestingly, I will um, tell you my journey with artificial intelligence. So it began when I was in high school, actually. And I, in high school, I was very interested in physics. And I didn't really know what the, it would ever be of any use to me in the future, but I spent a lot of time uh, studying the mass, spec, mass spectrometry machine uh, when I was in high school. And it turns out, I'll tell you the story later, the, the, um, the spoiler alert is that it turns out it was actually very useful to me uh, in the future. But I, of course, I didn't know at that time. And so it started with high school. And uh, my journey, I call it the pre-artificial intelligence time, which is my time at Grinnell College. You can see a picture of me in the left-hand side. That's me doing field work. I started studying uh, biological systems and ecology. That was one of my interests. And I did a lot of field work. I spent a lot of time in the lab looking under a microscope, looking at uh, different um, insects and um, different things that we had a project called Prairie Restoration, and we were interested in human interventions on the ecological system. So we studied how fire and mowing uh, would affect the uh, diversity of the invertebrates and insects uh, of the prairie. So that was something we were um, really interested in. I spent a lot of time looking at different types of insects under the microscope, trying to categorize them, trying to um, figure out the ecological impact of this. And uh, this culminated in a uh, discovering of new species. So I discovered five new species of uh, columbula um, when I was in college. And um, this was a paper that we published describing the five new species that I discovered. Um, so that was a really a pre artificial intelligence time. I call it the naturalist time. It's if you think of in history, the naturalists like Darwin went out in the field, collected samples, and then came back and studied the different species and different animals and trying to figure out their relationship with their environment. But a lot of it is done manually. Most of it is done with manual identification and looking at the um, what the the species looked like uh, under a microscope. So there wasn't very much computation involved in these studies. So that's why I call it the pre-AI time. So I really had very chance encounter with AI early in college uh, during a summer. I spent a summer doing a rotation or you can call it a summer um, summer study um, at uh, UC Irvine. And uh, at that time, I was studying uh, genetics. I was became interested in genetics. And I spent a summer at UC Irvine. This is a picture that ChatGPT generated for me yesterday when I put in what exactly was my project. It actually looks a lot cooler than what the project really was. So the summer project was looking at uh, rats. And we had different types of rats. One of them was prone to um, having hypertension and the other kind was resistant to hypertension and we were trying to figure out what are the genetic factors underlying hypertension um, and uh, potentially using that information to inform human studies. Uh, my specific study was looking at the biological clock or circadian rhythm and we found that there were actually two types of mice, um, uh, rats, that one kind that could get up early and just get going and their metabolism shoots up immediately and they are up and running very quickly. And then there's another kind of rat and that's genetically determined actually. They tend to like to stay in bed a little longer and they are not as active when they get up and takes them much longer to reach the same metabolism and activity level than the other kind. So I thought that was really interesting because it's probably the same in humans as well, where some people can just get up early and be active while others and take a much longer time to become active during the day. So that was one of my projects. And uh, after that, I, um, continued my interest in genetics. And here's a picture of a heat map of a chromosome. Uh, of a chromosome. Uh, this is also uh, in um, 
in uh, rats. And this project I actually did in Germany. Um, so like I said, I spent six months in uh, Berlin doing a study abroad program. And I took all my classes in German. And this was a project uh, I did actually at the uh, Max Planck Institute. And uh, I was very fortunate to work with a lot of scientists who were interested in studying, hy again, hypertension, but they were using a rat model. So these are gene chips uh, data from a rat model. And we were trying to figure out what are the genetic background of, of um, hypertension. So these are some early encounters I've had with genetics, with uh, computational biology, and um, essentially, uh, a lot of the things I would end up doing actually really set the background and the foundation of what I would uh, end up do doing. And on the right hand side, I have a picture of a very thick book. It's called Algorithms. It's one of the um, classic books that uh, students of computational biology or computer science have to study. And it's really the foundation of, uh, of a lot of the things is learning the different algorithms or different ways you can have a computer do the things um, in the way that you want it to do and different ways of talking to, to the computer. So these are some of my early encounters with uh, artificial intelligence. And I'll explain in a little bit uh, what artificial intelligence really is and, um, and the different types of fields in artificial intelligence in general. So after those early encounters, uh, I went to a medical school and I didn't really do very much with artificial intelligence or AI or very much research. Uh, in fact, in medical school, most of my time was spent on in classrooms learning about physiology and anatomy. And then I became interested in cardiac surgery because I started shadowing a um, cardiac surgeon at uh, the, the hospital um, that's uh, affiliated with my medical school, the Dartmouth Hitchcock um, Hospital. And um, I, it was really very, uh, by serendipity, I did not think I would become a surgeon. I thought I was very much interested in genetics. I was very much interested in research. So I wanted to really apply this. I thought the best field for me would be pediatrics or internal medicine. So I thought I should rule out the things I definitely would not do. And surgery was top of my list. So I thought, well, before I rule it out completely, I should probably go find out what surgery really is before I rule it out completely. So I went, I emailed the chief of cardiac surgery at Dartmouth at that time. And I said, I'm a first year medical student. I don't really know anything about surgery. I just wanted to come shadow you for a day and see what surgery is like. I probably will end up do uh, end up doing medicine or pediatrics. And interesting, he was uh, he was very welcoming. He he said, "Oh, why don't you join me in the operating room tomorrow?" And I did. I, I skipped class that day. I went to the operating room, and that was it. I was immediately hooked. I loved the operating room. I loved seeing the anatomy, the physiology. And uh, at the end of the day, I said, oh, can I come back? Because this is so interesting. This is so different from sitting in a classroom. And he said, well, why don't you come back tomorrow? So then I just kept going back and and and, and um, I stopped going to class because all of our classes were recorded. So I would just go to the hospital and shadow him in the operating room every day um, and then come home and listen to the lectures and learn. I turned them to two times speed so that I could speed up the learning and I would learn the all of the classroom material on my own at night. Um, and this lasted uh, for uh, the rest of my medical school career, actually. Um, I, I really enjoyed the operating room. At first, I was just observing. And then one day he said, you've been observing for a month. Why don't you uh, come scrub with us? So then I scrubbed in. And then one day he said, oh, you've been scrubbing for, uh, for a month now. Why don't you make an incision today? So that's where as a medical student for the first time, I made an incision. And then I learned how to suture. I learned how to do a lot of things. And at the end of my third year, um, I, I was 
I was set and I thought there was nothing that I would do and nothing would make me happier than being a cardiac surgeon and that's how I became a cardiac surgeon um so um unfortunately my mentor passed away during COVID um and and it's it's really a very sad loss I think he he would be I, at the time I was still in fellowship, so I think you you probably would have been very happy to know that I, I ended up indeed being a being a cardiac surgeon. So what exactly is AI, machine learning and deep learning? Some of you have probably heard about these terms. Um, the term AI or artificial intelligence actually came about since the 1950s, where people were trying to figure out ways where a machine could think like a human. So to simulate human brain activity and human computation and things that humans can do using a machine. So that's artificial intelligence. And machine learning was very popular. The term was very popular from the 1980s to about 10 years ago, and even now it is. Um, so machine learning really is a way to um, have the machine learn like humans. So for example, here's an example. When you receive an email, how do you know if it's spam or ham? How do you know if this email is useful to you? Well, machine learning can help you do that. So it, it can learn where you have tagged a lot of your emails as spam. Then it'll look at all the emails and find out what are the characteristics? What are the defining characteristics of an email being spam versus things that an email being useful to you. For example, if it is addressed to you uh, personally, if it contains uh, personal information, and that could be something that's useful versus if it's a spam, it's more likely that's very general and uh, very generic, or it does not contain any information. Um, so these are the ways that machines can figure out and do a lot of the things for you. So that's machine learning. And since the 20 teens, we've been doing deep learning and deep learning really is a lot different. It's a, uh, a type of machine learning, but deep learning really is the um, really the forefront of uh, artificial intelligence right now. And I'll explain to you in a minute what deep learning really is. So machine learning versus deep learning in a traditional model of machine learning. So traditional machine learning, you have to use handcrafted features or characteristics, which is very tedious. So if you have something, for example, you want to want to you have emails and you try to divide it into spam versus ham, then you want to find what are the features or what are the characteristics that would define this as spam versus ham. Well, if you use machine learning, you kind of have to start somewhere where you the user has to define some of the features and use machine learning to classify and get an answer. Well, deep learning is very different. Deep learning really just takes over completely and the whole process is automatic. So using neural networks, which are modeled after how human brains work actually, deep learning takes over and takes an input and gives you an output. Everything becomes a black box. Essentially everything is taught, it is, is learned. And um, at the same time, a lot of this human Inter interactions are no longer needed. So a lot of the feature, a lot of the um, handcrafted features, a lot of the manual work is now no longer needed. And it, the machine now is able to think like a human and automatically uh, takes an input and learn a lot of information just like the human brain does. So deep learning really is the forefront of machine learning these days and the forefront of artificial intelligence these days. Um, so my early encounters with artificial intelligence in medicine uh, really started during my time at Duke. And I started as an intern at Duke uh, in general surgery. And after two years of general surgery, 
I decided, uh, well, it was required for us to go into the laboratory and do research. And at that time, I decided that I wanted to pursue a PhD because I really wanted to uh, do in-depth research. And I thought that I needed a lot of the skills that were not taught to me in medical school or in residency. So I um, enrolled in the uh, PhD program in computational biology. And that that's how I got started using a machine AI in um, in medicine. And this is a picture of very ambitious goal that we wanted to achieve. So here's a picture um, on the x axis. It's, this is time on the y axis is the disease progression. And here's a picture of someone who typically has coronary artery disease. And we know that coronary artery disease happens because there's plaque buildup in the arteries and then the arteries become narrower and narrower and there's decreased blood flow. But we don't really know, for example, when the plaque is first forming, who are the people that are going to become going to be affected with disease in the long term. So for example, if we can catch the patients who are going to be a future patient versus a future healthy person very early in their disease course, then we can really do a lot of the preventative measures. And for example, control their cholesterol, control their uh, blood, uh, blood pressure, a lot of things that we can intervene on very early if we can predict who's going to be a patient in the future. And we can really reduce the incidences of heart attacks and of um, and of of bad outcomes in these patients. So we what we did was we actually collected blood samples of patients who have come through our uh, cath lab to get a cardiac catheterization where they have a catheter inserted in their arm and you do injections of their coronary arteries to see if they have coronary artery disease. At that time, we collected a sample of a blood sample and actually ran it through the mass spec machine. And here's where my high school experience with mass spec machine actually came in handy. Um, and we were able to really process the signals there and analyze the data and to be able to predict uh, who are the people who are going to be a future patient versus who are the people who are going to be maintaining uh, health over the long term. So this is uh, one of the very exciting projects that we did. Um, and this project really utilized artificial intelligence well in a lot of the steps for example the data processing steps of trying to figure out the signal from the noise and the data analysis step where um, we try to try to find the um, relationships between a lot of the data and trying to figure out what how we can classify these patients So this is the, the picture I, I loved from my days in my PhD. So it really teaches you how to put everything into perspective. So here you imagine a circle that contains all of human knowledge. As you progress through your training, you start with, you know, finish elementary school, you know a little bit, high school, know a little bit more, and then you get a master's degree and you read some research papers, and then you are at the forefront, the boundary, where you focus on the boundary. And that's really what the PhD is. It's where you push the boundary for a few years, and then one day you make a little bit of progress, and then they give you a PhD because you've made a dent. You have closed a small gap in the human knowledge and you think the world is different now because you think wow you made such a grand impact but just remember right the bigger picture is actually here the, the all of human knowledge so even though you think you have really broken down boundaries you have really contributed to the gaps in knowledge really what you know is very little compared to everything else. And I think this really puts everything into perspective. And, and I think about that often where sometimes we are so tunnel visioned in, in our own fields and we think, wow, I have made such a 
such a big impact, and but actually you haven't, right? There's a lot of people doing groundbreaking work and your your piece is really very small piece that fits into the bigger bigger picture. And so um, after thinking about that, so what can artificial intelligence do today? Well, artificial intelligence can do a lot of things now. From our experience in COVID, we were able to, we found out that artificial intelligence imaging assisted diagnosis systems can identify COVID pneumonia within 20 seconds. Um, so this is just an example of a patient, a CAT scan. And when you upload the CAT scan using uh, artificial intelligence algorithms, they can, like I said, a deep learning algorithm where they can look at um, thousands and millions of CAT scans and figure out what is what is uh, this patient's diagnosis? And AI is so good at diagnosing diseases now that within 20 seconds, it can tell you if this person has COVID or not. And here is another example. Um, this was published in, in January where the Google AI actually has been tested against human doctors. I think it's really interesting. Uh, I think it, it's not surprising to me that Google AI makes better diagnosis. It is a little surprising that it has actually better bedside manner than human doctors. Um, so so that's that's to say that um, they've compared Google AI with uh, human doctors. In making a diagnosis uh, for doctors is really based on the symptoms of the patients, their laboratory tests. And a lot of it is uh, for a lot of experienced doctors, it's really based on their their past experience. And it's a type of pattern recognition. So combined with the symptoms, the tests, and doctors in their past experience, and they'll make a diagnosis. But pattern recognition is actually what AI is best at. Like I said, recognizing something that's COVID pneumonia from a CAT scan, for example. And that AI is really good at that. It's able to take in a lot of the input and think like a human brain and really let the patients know what their diagnosis is. But the, the most surprising thing here is that they have better bedside manner, I thought, that uh, AI is actually able to interact with the patients and really know what the patients want. Um, it's, um, it's, all, it's, a, it's a very good listener, in addition to a very good diagnostician, I think. Um, and I think it's it's very interesting that uh, that we are at this step now, where a lot of the diagnosis I think in the next ten years will be made by human plus AI or AI alone. And um, a lot of the uh, we're there are a lot of fields now, for example, pathology and radiology, where AI is making a huge impact of being able to uh, it, analyze the images, the raw images and make a diagnosis. Um, the other one uh, AI is, uh, is taking over is treatment decisions. Um, here's a picture of how um, deep learning enables breast cancer um, homo hormonal receptor status determination just from pathology slides. So for a patient with breast cancer, and a lot of it is treatment is dependent on what type of hormones this breast cancer is receptor is uh, sensitive to. And oftentimes it's very hard to determine just looking at a slide. But now um, AI is able to take random samples from a slide and you put it through an AI algorithm and it's able to tell you whether this patient has an estrogen receptor um, positive uh, breast cancer or not. And this really helps patients determine the next step in their treatment. This is very different from uh, what we used to do, which is very manual work where the pathologists get the slide and they look at the, the slide under a microscope and then they try to determine, sometimes they all disagree with each other, one pathologist uh, with a different one, or even one pathologist one day versus the next day. Sometimes they'll 
they all disagree with uh, what what they think what hormone receptor this is but with ai we can actually go from the raw images and within seconds and um, output what the receptor is so this really is going to i think revolutionize how pathology is done um there are a lot of broader impacts of AI, for example, helping um, uh, people design clinical trials, helping set up different types of experiments, and uh, um, almost every field in medicine, so radiology, pathology, uh, gastroenterology, almost every field, I think, will be affected by AI. And thinking about the horizon of AI in medicine, uh, precision medicine is um, what we are hoping to do. So we know that there every day there are large trials conducted on patients, millions of patients, and then we try to come up with the best recommendation for these patients, but that's not what patients want. Patients want what's best for them as a unique individual. And that's where precision medicine comes in. It will take into account patients' genetic background, their environment, even their diet and their, uh, their lifestyle and be able to come up with the best recommendation or diagnosis or prognosis for the specific patient. Uh, there's a lot of integration of AI in robotic surgery and then AI in global health as well. So um, this is uh, our laboratory, which we call the Cardiovascular Precision Medicine Laboratory. Um, we study cardiac surgery, computational biology, and bioengineering. Uh, we what we want to focus is uh, precision medicine, and we want to create personalized diagnostic and treatment for patients with cardiovascular disease. And I will explain that in a minute of, with some of the projects that we are actively doing. Um, so one of our projects is discovering biomarkers in disease, and this is a lot of it is uh, looking at markers of um, um, of aortic aneurysm diseases and trying to figure out are there markers that will correlate with disease or that can help us diagnose, for example, aortic dissection. Um, other projects we're doing are um, minimally invasive surgery and uh, monitoring of patients after their surgery. And um, another area we're looking at is um, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and personalized risk assessment of patients, and then surgical education. And here's an example of um, what we do in um, assessment of surgical videos. And some of you might be surprised to hear that uh, the um, to be boarded in as a thoracic or cardiac surgeon, the our boards is completely based on written knowledge. So we take the boards and uh, we take a written exam and then we take an oral exam where we are tested on knowledge, but there is no test of your skills. So surgeons are certified and allowed to operate on patients, but no one has actually uh, assessed surgeons' operative skills or technical skills. Because in the past, it was impossible to do. If you ask each surgeon to submit a video of them operating, it would be impossible to go through all the videos and figure out if this surgeon is safe or not. But now with artificial intelligence, we can actually do that. Um, we can take a surgical video and use machine learning and deep learning uh, neural networks and try to figure out if this person is competent or not. In fact, the, um, the algorithms can automatically select the most important part of an operation and focus on that part of the operation. And uh, with uh, this is integrated into robotics. So there's feedback of where where the surgeons are looking at and how their hands move and whether it is a, a safe move for for the patient or not so now we're actually able to help uh, assess someone's technical ability to operate um, another example is a personalized risk assessment and this is 
for for example, for patients with an aortic aneurysm um, who may have a risk of dissection, it's not one size fits all. Right now, the guidelines say if someone's aorta is greater than 5.5 centimeters in size, they should be referred to a surgeon. Or if they have other types of surgery, if they're going to have cardiac surgery anyway, then they should be referred when it's greater than 4.5 centimeters. But this is very different for for people. For example, women are generally smaller size than men. So a 5.5 centimeter aneurysm in a woman would be very different for men. Your family history is important. The genetic background is important. And then other, mm -hmm. other um, hemodynamic parameters or um, factors are also very important. So how do we leverage all of this information and come up with an assessment that's unique to the person, to the patient in front of you, as opposed to the 10 million patients that we've seen in the world? Well, that's where um, personalized risk assessment comes into, into play. And that's where artificial intelligence is able to help us and recognize and taking into account a lot of these individual factors for individual patients. And that's something we want to do as well. So thinking of, uh, of all of this, uh, my journey in general, or in the, the journey I've taken, this is from the, the first slide. I think of it as different types of dots that are interconnected. And, uh, and when you're, you know, when, when you're actually going through everything, like when I was going through high school, I never thought learning about mass spectrometry would be important or any use in the future. And when I was doing these genetic studies in rats, I never thought they could actually be the, a lot of the same methods could be used to study human genetics. And um, I think a lot of the things really only make sense and come together in retrospect. And when you're going through, you never realize uh, most of these dots are actually interconnected and everything you learn may contribute uh, to your to your future. So so that is that is my journey, and um, I'm happy to answer uh, any questions. So, uh, Dr. Wong, thank you so much. This is Karen. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yep. I mean, that was amazing. I learned an awful lot, um, and I think I know for me as we were approaching this topic tonight. I was expecting to learn more about sort of robots in the OR, right? Like actually doing our surgeries as cardiac patients. So, um, you know, I, I learned a heck of a lot. I'm curious to know, um, there was a, a, a gra all of your graphics, your slides, everything really, really informative. Um, you know, the, a couple of the examples that you shared with us in terms of um, blood samples being collected from the cath lab, um, and uh, even the breast cancer um, slide as well. Are those um, actually being utilized right now? Like, are those mainstream? Is that really happening in hospitals? Is it slowly starting to, to kind of creep in? Is it at bigger institutions and not yet at the smaller ones? Yeah, it's it's slowly. Um, so uh, when I was at Duke, we collected blood samples on over ten thousand patients who've come through the cath lab, actually, and we've utilized that. We de developed um, a specific platforms to analyze the blood samples, the very small molecules in them, to help us um, better predict the risk for the patients. But they are not utilized universally yet. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of these are are still in development. Yeah. Dr. Wong, maybe you want to um, um, stop sharing your screen and maybe we sure. can see everybody else and maybe take some questions a little more casually. Um, sure. anybody, anybody else have any thoughts or questions they'd like to ask? Go ahead, Ash. Doctor, are the blood samples different from a, when you're taking it from a cat lab versus in a regular lab? Uh, the, the blood samples are the same, yeah. Oh, they're the same. The analysis is different. 
so it's not the the routine labs that we do. Um, what we did was we actually look at the very small molecules at a um, much smaller scale, not not a routine lab. Okay, uh, I'm a personally a former patient of open arm surgery. Okay, so I had some bad experiences doing the surgery, but I came more successful. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, Ash. Hey, I got a quick question. So, Dr. Wong, is this a, a, a national database that uh, everybody contributes to in order for you all to get the information from AI or to deal with the algorithms? Uh, I wish or there were a national registry or national database a lot of these work is actually done at uh locally yeah and okay, we're, so we're trying to collaborate with different institutions to do these work but um there isn't a national registry unfortunately okay but so each hospital determines their own algorithm um, so the, the algorithms are, you know, the algorithms are, are not the hard part. The data is a hard part because the algorithms are already developed and in place. Um, the algorithms are can be tested, but we need a lot of data to be able to um, develop these algorithms. So. How, how come the data is different? You said data is more different than the algorithm. No, I'm saying that to, you know, they're, they're, the, al the algorithms we have, we can use them and train them, but they need to be trained on a lot of data. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, so each one, go, go ahead. ahead, Brian, finish so up. Go, um, so the doctor enters whatever information to customize for that particular patient, correct? Mm-hmm. All right, uh, that, uh, we we on the same page now. So, at what point do you all get the information back? Does the doctor sign off on AI, or does AI sign off on what the doctor believes? <laughs> well, we're not using that yet in in practice okay. yet. Right now, I think uh, most of the time it's still the doctor making the decision for the patient. And what we want to do is have doctor use the AI as a guide or as an aid to help them make decisions. Okay. All right, next person, go ahead. My mind is all over the place. Um, I wanted to circle back to um, the lack of the assessment of surgical skills of doctors. I mean, a lot of us in this group have had open heart surgeries and, and cardiac, cardiac care and, and procedures. So is that is that um, just in the U.S. or is that pretty common worldwide? It's it's worldwide. There is really? no standardized assessment anywhere wow. in the world. That is interesting to me. Very interesting. And I know there's a couple of us who um, uh, um, have uh, histories with aneurysms and dissections. So I know that we are particularly interested to see um, where your research goes with that. Anybody else want to chat a little bit? Norm, it looks like you've got something to say. <laughs> I, I, I have one question. Like, as you said, Karen, my, my mind is just blown away, thinking in all sorts of different directions. Dr. Wang, you used a very important phrase a, a couple of minutes ago and during your presentation, helping the patients make, make decisions and making decisions, obviously, based on working with their, their physician or physicians. Uh, what can you give us a few examples of how artificial intelligence will will help us make those kinds of decisions? Um, a lot of people we we go to Doctor Google often for advice, or you know Chat GPT or any any of those others. How are, how are we going to pick and choose between these different kinds of uh, artificial intelligence tools that are available to us as heart patients? Uh, that's a great question. For example, I have an app. Um, on my phone, it's called Aorta. And um, it's something that a lot of us use actually in clinical practice where, um, so so the, the app is, um, it's built on a lot of data collected from patients. So if you put in the, the size of their ascending aorta, aortic root, and then 
add in the risk modifiers of these patients. Are they Do they have a family history of dissection? And do they have a bicuspid aortic valve? And then the different types of genetic background for this patient. And then it'll actually make a recommendation for you and say, does this patient need their aortic aneurysm addressed at this point or not? And, and, and I, th I think as a, as a follow-up, I think we're all probably resisting the impulse to go uh, Google aorta right now on the app store. <laughs> and there's it's an app on your iPhone, yes. <laughs> Which could be really dangerous in, in our hands. It sounds like that's more for, for, for physicians, at, at least for now. How do you think tools like that will filter down to what people like us can use in the future, again, in consulting with our physicians? Yeah, I think a lot of it can be used. I mean, ChatGPT is is very commonly used by by everyone now. Actually, I uh, gave a talk on how to use ChatGPT just last week to uh, members of my lab, and and I'm going to give another talk to the to the rest of the faculty members on how to use ChatGPT. Uh, I think it's a wonderful tool, and I think patients can learn a lot from this. Um, the the challenge is really sorting out what's useful and what's uh what's um um correct information thank and you just, just to add on to that in terms of being a patient it seems like there's a lot of trust that needs to start um sort of trickling down right physicians mm -hmm. trusting it and then um sort of communicating to the patients that we should trust it and i do i thought it was so fascinating that the um the Google study and bedside manner that you mentioned. I mean, that's a, that's really fascinating. And I do think, um, and you've seen this, I'm sure, in your career, and especially as heart patients, I think we talk a lot about our emotions and our intuition. Something doesn't just doesn't feel right. You know, mm -hmm. I have some some issues going on right now, but you know, I wonder with those sort of nuanced um sort of sensations and symptoms that we're having mm -hmm. how did what how does ai you know sort of tap into that and and how does that feed into the algorithm or is that still really dependent on the physician as a person to sort of decipher that kind of stuff yeah i think right now it'll still depend on the on the physician and their experience right the i think what the the benefits of ai is it it's has the collective experience of a lot of physicians. So you're not just basing your judgment on an individual physician as an experience. And I, I tend to think of uh, chat GPT having the knowledge, the entire human knowledge, right? Of the last 5,000 years, it really has the entire human knowledge. And, um, but how do you how do you use that compared to the individual experience of a physician? I think this will be very important. Yeah, and, and patients too. Patients, I think I firmly believe that patients know their body best. Um, and when they think something is wrong, most of the time they are correct. And if we, I mean, if at some point, I, I hope that we get to a point where you know, every every little change in a person can be monitored and can be um, utilized to to go into a decision making. And Dr. Wang, I had a question or a comment. I'm really curious about how the surgeons responded to or are currently responding to the Google survey about bedside manner. I mean, is that motivating them almost like spring training for a baseball team to realize <laughs> what the perception is? Because I've always said, you know, surgeons are fantastic. Most of them, if not all of them, but really obviously what separates one from the other is in fact the bedside manner. Yeah, I, I've shown it to several of my colleagues and they don't they don't believe it and they, they don't think an AI can actually do to be a better better a bedside manner than than a um a physician. But but it's true. I think a lot of I think a lot of a bedside manner is being able to um put yourself in the patient's shoes and and to be able to think from their perspective. And I think AI is particularly good at that. I think, um, interestingly, I think empathy is one of the strengths of AI um, because it was built to think like a human and it was built to really 
think things from other people's perspectives. So I, I think it's it's very, it's quite understandable that uh, AI has, um, when you are in a conversation with AI, you'll notice that there's a lot of empathy and there's a lot of them thinking from your perspective. Um, I, I hope physicians can, can start thinking about that and maybe that could be a training tool. Uh, you know, I remember in medical school, we had, a whole semester of classes on, um, it's called on doctoring. It's teaching you how to be a doctor. It's really nothing about the medical knowledge, but it's right. about how you approach patients, how you ask open-ended questions and how you make the patients feel at ease. And I think it, we could potentially incorporate that into the training of doctors. Well, I'm, I really believe that that's something that can't be taught in medical school. I really think obviously the doctors either have that in their heart or they don't. And again, that really what separates them all. Um, and again, it's such an intangible that it's really hard for me to grasp But AI ranked higher when obviously you used the word empathy. And I always thought the word empathy meant the ability to put yourself in somebody's position when you have been through the same situation. And obviously AI has never been through that situation besides programming it to do so. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it, it well, the, the interesting thing is, you know, it, it, it has never been in anyone's situation, but it has um, really, I think, to some extent, understood what it means to be in, in the different, in those situations. Well, fantastic presentation. One other comment off the wall, and I know it's out of your realm, but I'm just curious, obviously with the AI research, which has been going on for a while, but it's certainly the wave of the future. And I'm sure it's extremely costly. Has the hospitals figured out yet how they're going to be building AI in the future? Uh, I know Hopkins is building a whole AI institute. Um, and it's, um, I know that it's hiring 80 data scientists, I think, to the institute to specifically work on AI. So I yeah, think but on the billing process, obviously, after surgery, you know, will there be a line for obviously AI? Obviously, there's a line for the anesthesiologist, the surgeon, this, that, and the other. Is there mm -hmm. going to be a separate line item for AI? Um, I, I don't know if there's going to be, but it, I mean, there maybe, should be. It's a cost yeah. involved. Yeah, it, it is. Yeah. Well, well thank you along, very much. It's a great presentation. And then along sort of those same um, lines, Jack, like what is insurance going to sort of- Of course. What's the relationship sure. with insurance and, and AI? And also um, sort of circling back on, on the same um, thread a little bit, um, what's the downside in terms of uh, patient privacy, HIPAA, that kind of thing? Is that of concern? That is of concern, yes, because, for example, uh, ChatGPT is now able to analyze data for for people, and I've had a Melka students and talk to me and saying, oh, they want to, you know, upload their data to ChatGPT and have it analyzed, and I said, well, you can't upload any patient-specific information, right, um, so it's going to be a HIPAA violation. I think it's it, it's going to I, I don't know if Hopkins has had any policies on that yet, but I think soon people are going to figure out that they that, that this is going to be a problem. And what's your take circling back to the insurance question with Jack um, in terms of a line item saying AI for, as part of your service? What, what are insurance companies thinking about this? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, <laughs> Uh, so interesting. I, I, I think our interests are spinning on this. And I think we could even have another session just on the non-medical implications. We are talking about, about the implications for insurance. What about the legal implications? Mm -hmm. uh, lawyers conceivably somewhere, there's no lawyers on this call salivating at the prospect of like, well, what was AI used in, inappropriately or should the doctor have used AI before cut it, cutting that? I mean, there's all sorts of, wow. <laughs> Mind yeah. Yeah, that's a good topic. Legal and billing information. How can we use that? Yeah, that's a good point, Ash. Yeah. Dr. Dr. Wong. I'm sorry, go ahead, Brian. Okay. Where does robotics fit in once kind of AI somewhat takes over? 
uh, robotics going to be do, do most of the surgeries or procedures versus uh, regular doctors or physicians? Well, interestingly, you know, when we talk about robotic surgery, a lot of people would don't realize that right now robotic surgery is still done by a doctor. So uh, the robot is not actually moving at all if the doctor does not move. So the robot does exactly what the doctor does. So if the doctor starts moving their hand, the robot arm will move, but the robot has, does not have the ability to move on its own yet. So we're still in the very early stages of robotic surgery. It sounds like the opposite, the operative word is yet. Yeah. <laughs> And one other, we were talking about the uh, blood and cholesterol and uh, blood testing. Can a sample be submitted and just run through AI and every possible disease or problem or uh, what they can foresee? Would that be possibly pop up at that point? Or it has to be specific to whatever you're asking for? Uh, right now, it's it's specific to what you are asking for. But what we're hoping to do is to right now, there's whole genome studies where you can submit a sample and they'll study your entire genome from the sample. So that is now a possibility. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And what do you think, Dr. Wong, at all this AI and even um, into the robotics in the OR, is this going to um, lengthen the careers of surgeons? Is this going to lengthen, like their ability to, you know, be be in the OR? Is it yes. going to, you know, like how is it going to affect those folks? As as a mom who has a kid in medical school and a kid in nursing school, so <laughs> yes, I think so. Even now with robotic surgery, even though the robot can't, you know, move on its own yet, but you with robotic surgery you can sit. So a lot of doctors who have back problems can continue uh -huh. to operate. So some some doctors have really lengthened their career already. I know of a surgeon who's, who's still operating, a thoracic surgeon who's still operating well into their late 70s. Be, 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 with the help of, of robotic. Yes, doing yeah. robot, yeah, robotic surgery, because uh, otherwise I don't think they would have been able to. Yeah, that's fascinating. Well, on one side, would it cut down on doctors, knowing that it, it may be headed toward the robotics, mm -hmm. or with the assist of, of AI? A lot of folks may not want to go in the medical field because I, I'm not necessarily needed. I guess computerized. Uh, that's true. Because Actually, that. the prediction is that in five years there will not be any more radiologists or pathologists. <laughs> wow! Because yeah. AI, AI will handle all of that. We'll address right. all of that. Wow! Right. That that was the question I was thinking when you were talking yeah. about empathy. Um, empathy, especially important for patient-facing physicians. Mm -hmm. Which is, and you know, we're cardiologists, radiologists, they're going to be there with the patient. But has anyone ever talked about, well, my radiologist or my pathologist? Right, exactly. This doesn't happen. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, uh, I, have a question. I have a question, doctor. What is the life of a surgeon in this area? Till when, how long do they last? How long? The, the uh, career of a surgeon really, in this right. area? Um, I, it's it's very variable. Some people retire in their sixties. Some people practice into their seventies. It's it's very yeah. it's quite variable. Yeah. Thank you. I I had dinner last week with actually a doctor that actually addressed this group a couple of years ago. He's I won't use his name. He's seventy six or seventy seven. He's still pushing calf. He's mm -hmm. doing he's a interventionalist and still doing doing calves and uh, steady as a rock and everything. Uh, and I obviously this has got to be case by case with people right. at any age. Can artificial intelligence? Do you envision it being used to kind of evaluate the 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 the, the ability of physicians to continue operating or yes. whatever at certain times? I th I think so. Yes. I'm thinking they kind of going to have to be forced to come into the future, go into the future. You know. Yeah, it's coming. <laughs> the future yeah. is coming. <laughs> Old school is coming. I think the I future think is here. Exactly, Jack. Yeah, exactly. the future is here. Doctor, it's a very good presentation you made. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Dr. Bong, thank you so much. Okay. But if there's not going to be any other questions... Um, one quick one. Oh, one quick one. I'm sorry, go ahead. Is there one book or article or something, Dr. Wong, you would recommend to people like us? 
to read or, or a website that we could better understand what's going on? Uh, yes, um, I read an article um, a while ago explaining this to the audience. I can send it out to Karen. Yeah, yeah send it to me. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Something sort of what is like uh, for the lay people of the world. Yes. Right? Yeah, mm -hmm. perfect. Yeah. That would be great. I look forward to it and I'll share it with everyone. But um, thank you so much. I'll see you around. Yep. Brian, you want to close this out? Well, folks, if there's nothing else, um, you all have a good evening and we will see you next month. Thank you. Thank all you right. very much. Thanks again, Dr. Wong. Thank good you. night, everyone. Thank you. All right, Nick. Thank you. Thank you.